special guest is about to join us. Thanks, folks. If you'd like to take your seats, please. Uh, we need to move on. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Thanks, folks. If you'd like to uh, please go to your seats, our special guest about to join us tonight. Come on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, please, uh, please take your seats now. We need to uh, move on. Um, Archbishop Peter over there in the corner, if you could just move your team down so we can get on with the evening. Thank you. Can we just have a little bit of quiet? Uh, thanks. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest speaker this evening is uh, one that's is so highly credentialed uh, in medicine, internationally, and uh, magnificent uh, record going down through the years, and we're so pleased to have a adjunct professor, Natasha Michael. If you look at your program tonight in the, in the uh, centre, you can read what uh, this lady has achieved so far uh, right around the world, and to see the work that she does globally, and especially here in palliative care uh, with cancer pain, etc., uh, it's quite quite amazing. So have a good look at uh, the credentials there and the CV of uh, this human being, she, because she has done a fantastic job. I know you'll give her all the, uh, the silence here tonight, and uh, please allow us to hear the story from adjunct professor Natasha Michael. Thank you, Brian. Oh, it's hard to follow a jockey and a skip by seminarians. And I can tell you I've given many, many talks, and I've never done one at 10 o'clock at night. So the first thing I'd say to you is fill your glass. The Archbishop has told me he'll double the alcohol budget for the night, because what you're going to listen to tonight is quite heavy, right? But in some ways, that's my job. We're not very popular as palliative care doctors. We don't get invited to many places. Uh, because of the nature of the work we do. But as I say to all my patients, the only difference between you and me is your horizon's visible and mine isn't. Right, because it comes to all of us. So tonight is a little bit of a public lecture where I'm going to try and tell you about the nature of our work and what we do. And I was very, really moved when I was asked to talk today, even though I had to put up with some puns. Andrew said, we're all dying to hear what you've got to say. <laughs> And my youngest daughter said, Natasha, mum, make sure it's really bad so you don't get asked to do these talks anymore. 
But in the 20 years that I've been a palliative care doctor, I've called on many, many priests, religious um, people, spiritual care providers to care for my patients when they are anguished or as they approach death. So tonight is when you really throw the money to these young people, and also for all the reasons and the work that they do in hospitals, because we need them. So Eugene and I were very touched when we visited the seminary in Corpus Christi. It was our first visit there, particularly when we met the young uh, seminarians, listening to their stories, their careers prior to joining the seminary, all the different countries they came from. And actually, it takes a longer to be a, a priest than it takes to be a doctor. And I can tell you there isn't a salary match. So <laughs> maybe it's time to ask for a pay rise. <laughs> So a very good evening to you, Archbishop Peter Comensoli, <laughs> Bishop Emmett Tomlinson from um, previously the Sandhurst Diocese where I work now, Reverend Cameron Ford's Connoisseur Tour too, Vince, Supreme Knight, Elaine and Julie. For those of you who don't know, Connoisseur Tour too is an Irish greeting. Paul Mitchell, fellow knights, generous sponsors and friends. And I thank you all for coming tonight. It takes tremendous courage to come and listen to a palliative care speaker on a Friday night. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you stories. And each story is accompanied by a photograph, and they've all been shown with consent from patients and families, because it might be the best way for you to relate to what I'm going to tell you. We might start by talking about the history of palliative care. The history of our specialty is worth knowing because the word hospice is derived from the Latin hospitum, meaning hospitality or place of rest and protection for the ill and the weary. In our Roman Catholic tradition, hospices were places of hospitality for the sick, wounded or dying, but as well as that for travelers and pilgrims. Historians believe that the first hospices originated in Malta around 065, therein the work with the Order of Malta, dedicated to the caring of the ill and dying en route into and from the Holy Land. And the Order of Malta, some of you may know or may not know, there's a lot of work in palliative care internationally, and particularly in Caritas Christi in Melbourne and Eastern Palliative Care. In the early 14th century, the Order of the Knights of Hospitality of St. John of Jerusalem opened the first hospice in Rhodes. And in the 17th century, the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul progressed the hospice movement in France. And in Western society, the concept of hospice began evolving in the 11th century. The early developers of hospice care included the Irish Religious Sisters of Charity, who opened Our Lady's Hospice in Harold's Cross, Dublin, where I was privileged to work and train in Ireland. And this occurred in 1879. It was with these Sisters of Charity that the founder of the modern hospice movement, Dame Cicely Saunders, found her vocation. Cecily was a remarkable lady, a staunch Anglican, who initially trained as a nurse, subsequently as a social worker, and then subsequently as a doctor. And in the, in the 40s, working in St. Joseph's Hospital in Hackney, where the Sisters of Charity were, she watched the sisters use something called the Brompton Cocktail. The Brompton Cocktail was an elixir, a mixture of heroin, morphine, uh, sorry, heroin, cocaine, dimorphine, and alcohol, and that was used to, to be given to terminally ill patients to alleviate their pain and their suffering. But it was also there that she met those who sought refuge, spiritual refuge or existential refuge as they approached the end of life. And Cecily started the modern hospice movement and gave clinicians the option of either moving apart, down the path of com continuous active intervention till the end of life or actually choosing to care for the whole person in their totality. And a very famous pr phrase of hers was, you matter because you are you and you matter to the last moment of your life. And many of us start, started our training in palliative care through these hospice movements. Cecily started an international movement around the world. 
including in Canada, where a man called Sabal Mount, a surgeon, coined the term palliative. The word palliative comes from the word pallium in Latin, which simply means to cloak or to comfort. So patients always say to me, oh, Dr. Michael, why don't you change your name? You know palliative care. Nobody wants to come to palliative care. But I could be the banana boat club, right? And people still wouldn't want to come to us because the reality is it's the nature of what we do, right? But Cecily focused on emphasizing the care of the patient rather than the disease and introduced this notion of total pain, which includes psychological, spiritual, and physical discomfort. So this slide was a slide that I, a picture I took of a patient when I was in my 20s working in Limerick, the west of Ireland, also known as Stab City, for those of you who know Ireland. He was a man with motor neuron disease and he couldn't speak. So we used to do our word rounds and he would write to me and that's how we communicated. And here you can see he's expressing what we would describe existential anguish. He says to me, Natasha, time, I don't think, I, I think I won't last long. And the social worker said to me, I think he wants to make a will. But actually what he was saying was, I don't have the will to live anymore. And part of what we do in palliative care is to try and work through some of these challenges or anguishes that patients face as they come to the end of their life. But it was through my training in the West of Ireland with a remarkable consultant called Sinead Donnelly that I really understood the concept of total pain. I still remember this man. I was 27 years old and his name was Pat Ryan, a very common name in the West of Ireland. He was a farmer and the nurses said to me, you need to see him because I think he's depressed. He doesn't engage, he doesn't talk to anybody, there's very little that we can get out of him. And he was in a four-bedded unit. And what I did was I watched him. I watched him for a couple of days, and this is what I teach young doctors, sometimes don't intervene too quickly, watch. And what he would do every day is he would stand by the window, and being a farmer, he would go out to the field every day and count his cattle and watch his animals, right? And the hospice leased a piece of land in front from the farmer, and there were cattle there. And what did Pat Ryan do? Every morning he stood in the window and he counted the cattle. I fixed his depression pretty quickly when I moved his bed to be by the window. And I said, Pat, can I take a picture of you? And I'll never forget what he did. He went into his wardrobe where he had a single item of clothing, which was his suit, and you can see the amount of weight he had lost, and he put him on. So when we talk about dignity in health, or we talk about dignity in uh, palliative care, we sometimes make it far more complicated than it needs to be. In this little moment, we gave this man, Pat Ryan, his dignity. Another lesson I had to learn very early on at the age of 27 was when I met this man who had pancreatic cancer. And I was visiting him at home and he died at home. And um, his wife laid with him through the night after he had died and until the undertaker came the following day. And I was very naive. I went back to the multidisciplinary meeting and I thought that was really gross, right? It was what a terrible, weird thing to do. But Sinead made me go back and do a bereavement visit. And in my bereavement visit, the story of their life together emerged. And his wife shared this photograph with me. And this photograph tells a million stories, really, of what loss or, or difficulties uh, cause or uh, bring to pain. I should have said this at the start of my talk, I'm sorry, but I was, uh, I suppose, a little bit distracted. But sometimes my talk triggers things. If you suffer an illness yourself, or you know someone else who has undergoing some challenges. So I'm sorry if I cause any distress. And I'm here if you want to come and chat to me after, or there are other ways we can look to support you. So 
thought of medicine takes a lot out of us as clinicians because of the emotional demands. And for 10 years, I ran a very large service in metropolitan Melbourne as the director. In my eighth year, I started to feel that I had lost my soul, had I become more of an administrator than a clinician. And so I went away in a kind of, you might call it a professional retreat as such. And for me to recover, I have to go where I can find quiet and solitude. I had a fair bit of leave at that stage, and I chose to go somewhere very rural. I went to Broken Hill, and I worked there for a little while where doctors fly in and fly out. And it was really where I found my soul again. This man was a remarkable man. I'll never forget working in Broken Hill. There's nothing there. It's the desert, right? There's a small hospital. I loved the quietness and the isolation of it. And there were five most amazing palliative care nurses, some of the most remarkable people. And they said, come on, Natasha, we're heading out on a day trip today. And we went down this down this old path to a house where we had to climb over the wall. And the first cage I walked had six cats with matted, all matted together. And then we walked past a cage with about 50 doves, each of whom had interbred. And then a little yard with three dogs and into a home where this man was. And he had a terrible tumor along his scalp and this was bandaged by the district nurse. He had a remarkable story. Despite his suffering, he shared such joy with me of his many, many years uh, as a jockey. And I always say to young doctors, have a look around the bedroom or have a look around the, doc the room when you visit your patients. They tell you many stories. And this was time that I also spent out in Broken Hill. And this is the sort of disease we see. This time in rural Tasmania and Broken Hill was really where led, led me to decide what I wanted to do next. After my years in metropolitan Melbourne, I work in a regional center. And I see things like this very commonly. And some of the photographs I don't show you because they're too difficult to look at. But there is terrible inequity in health, particularly in palliative care. The work of Villa Maria Catholic Homes and the work of the groups like Mercy Health are really important because they serve the underprivileged, and I hope increasingly so in underprivileged areas. You take a train ride 40 minutes out of Metro Melbourne where young doctors don't want to work, and this is what you see. The remarkable thing of all of these patients was they shared and demonstrated tremendous joy. And they had that because they had family, friends, and companions around them. Their suffering was alleviated through the simple act of accompaniment. My job was to assist with medication, promote healing, etc. And these patients require very specialist drugs. So people think that all we do is care for the dying. We don't. We care for people before they die, some of whom tremendous suffering suffer tremendously. There are some moments that you remember forever. This was June in rural Tasmania who refused to go home. And in the end, we negotiated that she would go home if I would do a home visit and made sure she had settled at home. So I arrived to visit June, at, and I found her sitting out in the sun in her leopard skin onesie and her fluffy hat and her chickens and her chooks running around her. Now, you might look at that and think, what are you doing, June? And it was actually the nurse who took this photograph. And I looked up, and I saw the nurse and all of the children standing at the window looking out. They said, Natasha, we thought you were both digging a grave together. <laughs> but actually, June was trying to show me her veggie patch. And I went home with five of the most magnificent parsnips. Now, Darren, I can tell you, there are days I wish I got 5% of $25 million. But <laughs> in moments like this, you're glad to just have have parsnips from somebody's garden, and you never say no, because it was not easy for her. She was very breathless and very sick to dig up her parsnips. But an important part of my research, which I'm not going to talk about today, is really how people use what's really important to them, the values that mean, mean a lot to them in how, in how they make decisions about the end of life. 
And Jean's family shoved this piece of document in front of me and said, Natasha, we can't talk to her about what she wants, so can you please have the conversation? It's called June's Wishes. So we sat in the sun together, and I will just read some of them for you. Sorry, but I have multifocals now, so I can't read from here. But one of the questions was, who would you like to be present at your wake? And June's initial answer was nobody, especially not the gossipers. But as our conversations proceeded, you can see her list went as longer and longer and longer, the list of family and friends that meant something to her. She spoke to me about how she wanted her body washed, prepared, wrapped, how she wanted to be cremated and the kind of urn that she wanted. It's what we call a values directive. And we documented this together, and I was able to share this with her family who found it difficult to have the conversations with June. But probably some of the most challenging work we do was that of young people, babies. I recently had to retrieve a baby who had come back from the Royal Children's Hospital to the regional area with the pediatricians. This was a remarkable young boy. He was 19 years old with Down syndrome, and he had two cancers. Unfortunately, the treatment from his first cancer led to a second cancer, which caused a, a big growth and fractures of all of the bones in his spine and his pelvis. And it took me a while to convince his parents to bring him into our palliative care unit, where we were very effectively able to keep him comfortable. It was, if you want to watch, true grief, you watch the grief of a parent losing a child. And in this case, there was a mother who had lost, was in the process of living, losing a second child with the first having taken her own life. The stress of this illness caused marital discord and to the point that I'm not sure that the marriage was going to be salvageable. Um, but there's another story to this story, such as these two remarkable young doctors. And one of the greatest joys I have as I get older is the mentoring and training of future palliative care doctors. In my 10 years of Cabrini, I think we trained close to 40 of them. And we have a training program where I am now at the Ludden Mallee, and it's just wonderful to see them grow and nurture. I'm only there two and a half days a week. These kids run the show. They run the phone to me, they're attentive, and they're only in their 20s or 30s. And the girl on the right, left, right, Erica, is talk about talent spotting. She, she's a, quite a remarkable young lady who we have really identified as somebody we will nurture and grow over the years to service the local community. I'm a clinician researcher. That means working closely with my patients allows me to think of questions that I want answered in the research space, and I work predominantly with Notre Dame with Professor David Kassim. The biggest challenge we faced in palliative care over the last three to four years has been the introduction of voluntary assisted dying. It's something we've had to get used to, we've had to adapt to. It's been challenging, and David and myself, with the support really of all the Catholic organizations in Victoria published the first Australian study trying to understand why people seek this. We think that it's pain, but actually autonomy we understand, but importantly people are suffering, and they suffer existentially more than they suffer physically. They also fear future suffering, and young seminarians and priests have a tremendous amount to offer in the alleviation of this suffering, and they want the reduction of burden and isolation in family life. It was through this work that David Kassane and a team of us developed something called the psycho-existential scale. We normally measure symptoms. We say to people, what's your pain like? What's your nausea like? How are you sleeping well? But here we measure something else. We measure anxiety, depression, pointlessness, hopelessness, loss of meaning. And this is the scores of a young lady, a young mother in her 30s who we could not get out of bed in the hospice. She just laid in bed all day. She had a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And it's only when you measure this distress of her that you get to understand it. It opens a narrative of conversation to be had and you intervene. It's this psycho-existential distress of helplessness, pointlessness, hopelessness that drives a desire for death. 
But the more exciting thing about our research is how we share it with others. So this is Jeanette Libet, who's right at the back. Jeanette's a wonderful research nurse David and I have worked with. And we have developed a partnership with our Singaporean colleagues because of my time doing my fellowship in Singapore. And I've done three trips this year. And on my third trip, I took Jeanette along. And the history of hospice care in Singapore, like it has around the world, arose out of religious connections. And we have trained over 90 staff in hospice care uh, uh, association in Singapore on the use of the PESAS tool. It's the first tool in the world to be measuring psychoexistential distress. And we've translated it to Chinese and to Bahasa Malayu. And our intention is to take it to the United States and to other places so that we get to, we really get to help people in what we call promote psychoexistential wellness. And you see suffering everywhere. So this was a home visit I did with my Singaporean colleagues. The man that you see there was a drug addict. He was a heroin user. And this is Norman in Southeast Asia. He sleeps on the floor. And actually, what you don't see behind the wall was his heroin user friend who was hiding while we were there, right? And you know, he died in terrible circumstances. We would go in, and the floor would be strewn with feces and excrement. And but his brother, who you see there in the purple shirt was there every day visiting him with those diligent and uh, attentive staff. Some of you might recognize Julian. I sent Julian and Sonia Smart from Villa Maria to Singapore for a reason, because we have a lot to learn from each other. The Singapore government has a policy of caring for the elderly and investing in palliative care. It's extraordinary when you visit the palliative care units there. They are outstanding, tremendous amount of philanthropy. And they are so keen to share their ideas. And there we had Sister Geraldine to keep Julian on a short leash, for those of you who know Julian. And um, that's St. Joseph's home, so Julian, am I right? Yes. yes. And, and then that's Assisi Hospice. Um, the other thing we have been doing in Singapore is I've been working with the team in HCA and they have won their first research grant ever because they have a lot of money but what they need is mentoring. And I was wonderful to take uh, Jeanette this time and Jeanette has actually in, been working with the nurses there and made a link back to Australia and uh, Archbishop Comensoli has you know, encouraged us now to do the similar sort of partnerships with the Middle East to look at promoting and the sharing of ideas and resourcing. So how do you stop yourself from burning out? And how do you manage all of this when you work in areas of high emotions? Everybody's got their own manner or way. I'm at high risk of burnout because I'm female and I'm psychoexistentially orientated and I'm quite emotionally contained when I'm at work. But I'm lucky to be married to Eugene who puts up with a lot and three daughters who put up with even more. And uh, we love being away and being quiet. And I rang in one day and I said, if I'm a bargain camper van, we better go. We're going to Kangaroo Island together. I didn't realize that the bargain camper one was actually the, the highest van, the second little one, not the Apollo. <laughs> Moral of the story is you're married to a five foot 11 Irish man, spend the extra bit of money and get the Apollo. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's these escapes that we, we try and get out and get away together that helps me recenter and set my head straight again. I travel to the region now. My favorite time of the week is a Monday morning when I catch the 702 train from Southern Cross and I work on the train. I do my academic writing. And so I get to work at 9 o'clock just in time to start my 9.30 world round. And I, and I come back on a Tuesday and I go up and down again on a Friday. But that time on the train is when I think I pray, I write. And my sleep. Um, and it's what resets me, really, and, and sustains me for my time forward. We also have fun. I had 10 very happy years at Cabrini. This is Mona, who let me use the photograph. We used to have Feel Good Fridays with a theme. This week's theme was flowers in your hair. Everybody came with flowers in your hair. And we stopped and we had a cup of tea, played the piano, and shared cake together at 3.30 on a Friday. 
and this is how we celebrated St. Patrick's Day every year with our two wonderful, when we were at Cabrini Peran, two wonderful receptionists who were there ironing clothes, bearing, um, you know, bringing hairdressers in for our hair dryers in for our patients. But the loss of a loved one is particularly challenging for families, particularly when they've never encountered an illness before. Confusion, disorientation, uncertainty. On a Tuesday morning at 8.30, I got a call, Natasha, we need you to come in now. We had a man admitted last night, and uh, you know he's gone from attending a picnic on a Sunday to you know being unconscious on a Monday, and the family are not prepared or ready for what's ahead. They say 24 hours is a long time in palliative care when you have an advanced illness. But it's only through the act of listening, the attention to the family, addressing their concerns, that within 24 hours we achieve this. My favorite part of the day is when I do my world rounds outside. These beautiful nurses wheel the beds out. Hospices are beautiful for this reason. They allow these things to happen. We wheel our beds out to the veranda, and you have this family in turmoil now, a complete peace and acceptance, sitting there, standing there having a cup of tea or coffee. I always say when patients are born, babies are born into the world, we welcome them and accompany them. So as people leave the world, we do the same, we accompany them. When I was at Herald's Cross, all the doors in the hospices opened up to the courtyard, and in the few days of Irish summers, few days of Irish summers, we would do our ward rounds outside. They were magnificent. This is a painting commissioned by Tate called The Doctor by Luke Fidels. It depicts a Victorian doctor observing the critical stage in a child's illness while the parents gaze on helplessly from the periphery. It portrays the value of the ideal clinician and the inadequacies of medicine. Different theories exist as to the painting's origin, but it's most likely based on Fidel's experience of the death of his own son. So in the work that we do in palliative care, we can do very little to cure, but we can do much when we accompany. Accompaniment seeks that we walk with, we lend solidarity, we counsel, we empower, and we don't enable anything that we might conscientiously object to. But this is only possible when there is shared vulnerability. As I get older, I'm not afraid of crying with my patients, honest conversations, and yet having the skill to maintain hope. These are skills that can be learned and they can be developed. We are not angels. There's nothing special about us. We are trained. My greatest experience of accompaniment is that with the Little Sisters of the Poor that I do some work with. Today is the feast of St. Jane Jugan, who cares, who is the founders of the Little Sisters of the Poor. So it was apt that I spoke of accompaniment today. I never meet any, I mean, many orders do that. Mother Teresa sisters do so. So how can we all help here? As parishioners, we all have a responsibility. We have a responsibility of being communities of caring, right? That when we know people around us are sick, uh, ill, then many, many family, but many carers say to me, you know, Natasha, I don't know what to say. You know, I know my neighbor has got cancer, but should I ask? Should I not ask? What should I say? Well, and the patient is there waiting for somebody to ring, somebody to ask, right? People are afraid to have these conversations. Parishes have a lot to offer of building these communities of care. And the work of the Order of Malta and promoting um, volunteer groups is tremendous. Support services like VMCH, all you young seminarians out here, all your parish bulletins should have services of Villa Maria attached. Everybody should know about what O'Neill House does in the care of palliative care patients. For those of you who don't know, Sonia Smart, the extraordinary CEO of Villa Maria, developed a nursing home specifically for palliative care patients. I hope it is the first of many more, and I hope there are some that are developed in other dioceses, particularly in these regional areas where we see these terrible diseases. So in life, it is easy to be enamored. Beautiful things, it's very easy to stay in our echo chambers where we are comfortable. It's only when we step out of our comfort zone, and for all of you under the age of 51, so now you know what my age is, 
there's a lot you can do. And you know, I know that many young teachers, medical students, etc. There are groups that are looking for people to volunteer on boards, committees. Put your hand up. Don't be afraid. A phone call to the Little Sisters many years ago has led me to a lifetime of involvement. And this is how we start. It's through these networks and the wonderful work that um, Melbourne Catholic professionals do, do with, where are you, David? David, our rock star. David Powick, I call him our rock star. I mean, these are events that every young professional should sign up to. And it's only through this networking, working together, Catholic care, um, center care, I think I've lost the names now, Villa Maria coming together and diocese is working together that we achieve this. So if you give generously tonight, remember that every seminarian that you support walks into a hospital. Every seminarian you support will provide sacraments to someone who's dying. Every seminary in your support provides respite to those of us who are working for the sick and the ill. So I hope this year you, uh, you gain over $100,000. And I think the most you've made, Carmen, you told me is about 80000 86000 If I'd known the Archbishop was bidding, I would have brought my stethoscope in. So <laughs> with that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, what a magnificent uh, last 25 minutes. You couldn't sort of hear a pin drop here. And to, to hold this audience for as quiet as they were, um, you empowered the audience here tonight. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you do for medicine, not only here in Melbourne, Australia, but globally. Um, we're in deeply indebted to you to being a part of tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll call on David Brown now to for a, a toast of thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Natasha. Um, I'd like to offer a vote of thanks to Professor Natasha. Uh, this is the second time that I've had the opportunity to listen to her speak, um, the first being at the Catholic Professional uh, Luncheon that she referred to earlier with, that David Powick organises. Both times uh, I have been moved deeply, and I thought it wasn't possible tonight to be moved even more deeply, but I certainly was. Um, I have such admiration for the people that work in this field um, and I only hope and I'm certain you know I'm not on my own here that uh, when the time comes that I have somebody like uh, Professor Natasha or somebody that she's trained to be there at the end. Um, I've been moved by her deep compassion, care and connection to faith. Uh, from a very early age uh, she's led a life of giving, caring and compassion. It makes me think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, which teaches, it, teaches us that true neighbourly love transcends social boundaries and calls us to act with kindness and care, even in the most challenging of circumstances. So please join me in thanking Professor Natasha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, uh, and again, thank you, uh, Professor Natasha. Uh, a marvellous speech here tonight.